Now, I'm going to continue on a series that I started a couple weeks ago on the home. And we can change our country if we change our homes. Our country is only as strong as the homes and the families that are inside this country. When we have a strong home, we'll have a strong country. And so often we have to answer a question today. Can I tell the difference between drama and trauma? So often in our homes, we do not see the difference between drama and trauma. And so often, we treat drama as it's a trauma center. And the traumas in our home, we left off as it's just drama. And we have a perspective of my home will survive just because it's a home. And we have to put in attention what trauma truly is. A job description of what I am supposed to do. Each successful corporation has a structure. Each corporation has many people to do what it's called to do. In the Bible, it is set up as a home. It is set up as a structure. And the founder of the home is God. The Bible has Paul, the CEO of the home, Dad. The president of the home is Mom. They make the decisions. The shareholders of the home are the kids. They get dividends because the president and CEO and the founder has done their job. But so often we allow the shareholders to decide what the president and what the CEO and even what the founder wants them to do. That is not the corporation. That is a circus. That is chaos. And so often when we look at chaos and we look at drama-driven homes, what we have to understand is God has a divine plan for the home. So when we look at one of the most popular medical industries going on, even in, the, in, in Wichita, is the immediate care centers. You see them popping up all over the place, don't you? Let me tell you this. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Panel has estimated that $48.3 billion was spent on emergency care room last year. $48 billion. You go into that emergency room because you have an ailment. Maybe you're sick or maybe you're hurt. But you go in there and the doctor that you do not know has taken care of a body that he's never seen before. He gives you medication and you go to a pharmacist that gives you the medication and you take that medication because you are sick. Well, folks, I want to tell you that I believe the home should be the trauma center of this country. A freestanding emergency room is good, but I believe that the trauma center that God has established for our home is I want to be the CEO, the president of a trauma center. It takes a process. It's hard work. So what does a trauma center look like? And where do you go? You go to a trauma center because of pain. You go to because you're hurting. And a mom and a dad that sits with the child and that child is hurting. Or maybe that dad is hurting and the mom understands the dad is going through some issues. Because there's pain, the trauma center should be kicked in. Or there's difficulty in life. We don't know what to do and how to do it. So the trauma center needs to step up. Because if the trauma center does not step up, somebody will step in. And the trauma center in the home also for the, for the questions of life. And you may be saying, well, my home is more like a mental hospital than a trauma center. <laughs> and that is so true as well. Your kids need to know that they are loved. Your spouse needs to know they are loved. Your kids need to know that they can be given attention from the CEO, from the president, from the physician. How do you do that? Whether you're sitting at dinner, whether you're driving in a car, whether you're going to bed, our kids in our culture today, our spouses in our culture today, we're dying. Our heart is broken. And sometimes we just need some CPR. CPR, all it is, is getting the blood flowing back into the veins, allowing the body to be healed. 
And so often our homes are walking around dead, destroyed, in chaos because of trauma. How do we do that? Well, I, I have the privilege now of, of being, my kids are grown. It doesn't mean I'm done being their parent, let me tell you. I get phone calls all the time. My car broke down. This thing, oh, I, I thought you moved away. Why do you need me? But older parents, it doesn't make any difference how old you are, right? Mommy and daddy are still going to be called. You could be 50 years old, and you're still going to call mom, and you're going to call dad. So how does the trauma center start? Let me give you some ideas. Ask them how they feel. Don't tell them how they feel. Ask them how they feel. How was your day? What was good about your day today? What was bad about your day? What are you looking forward to doing this weekend? What can we do together? Ask our students questions. So often in a drama center, we allow the drama to captivate our homes and we have a four or five hour crazy time at night and we're all mad, we're all going to our own separate rooms and it's just chaos because we allow the drama of the day to carry on through the night. Someone in your home is hurting. Someone in your home right now is struggling. And it depends on the desires of your home. Whether it's caused by chaos or it's caused by drama or it's caused by trauma, somebody is hurting. And sometimes, as a physician, we don't know that they're hurting. Because if we go to the emergency room and we have a broken arm, or we have a car wreck, Johnny, last night, and we crack our necks and we go crazy, we go to the emergency room and the doctor can see the ailment. But we go home after a bad day at school or at work, or we just broke up with our boyfriend or girlfriend, and we are devastated. And sometimes we look at that drama as, oh, well, you'll get over it. It won't last long. But that drama that they went through is actually trauma that could change the decisions that they make. So what we have to do as moms and dads, as brothers and sisters, is we have to take that child, or we have to take that student, and we have to talk to them. Because if we do not talk to them, somebody else will influence them. Dads, somebody else will love them. Somebody else will take care of them. They may have shattered self-esteem. Or their fear is captivating. Or their heart is broken. And they could be just grieving. And we understand the grieving process when something catastrophic takes place. We understand the grieving process at a funeral. We understand the grieving process when we have loss. But with a teenager, that grieving process could cause all kinds of different issues. As simple as a fight with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or a cat fight with two high school girls. Or maybe a fist fight with guys catastrophic. If you can't go home into a trauma center and be taken care of at home, we have problems. So here's what happens. Students, they go to peers. They probably won't give them the best advice. And if they don't go to the peers and they can't go to the home, then they turn to substance. Or if they don't turn to substance, what happens to some is they turn in and they swallow and they take that anger and they take that bitterness and they take that fear they take that anxiety and they said I can't talk to mom I can't talk to dad I can't talk to a teacher I can't talk to a preacher I just don't want to talk to anyone so they swallow it and then they become bitter and they become cold and then all of a sudden, as a mom and dad, you get this bright idea after church one day that you're going to preach to your kids. That preacher told me I should talk to them. So we captivate them and we put them in, this, in a chair. We say, what's wrong with you? And we haven't talked to them in years, but all of a sudden now, 
Since the preacher got me on this one, I'm going to make them open up and tell me everything that they've ever done wrong. And they have swallowed that bitterness and that envy and that cold heart for so long that they don't know what to do. So how do we turn a drama center into a trauma center? Well, adults, it starts with you. You're the doctor. You're the physician. You're the all-wise one. You wouldn't go to a doctor if the doctor was drunk. You wouldn't go to the doctor if you thought he was high. You wouldn't trust the doctor if every time you talked to him he yelled at you. You'd go to the doctor that you had confidence in, that you knew he was clear in his mind. Adults, we do the same thing as the kids. Sometimes we take our alcohol, or we take our pills, or we go to the opposite sex, or we have achievement binges for our life and for our satisfaction. Anything to distract my issues. That's what we do as adults. So that's what our kids are going to see. See, we, and many of us, experience this all the time. We either do one or two different things. We are just like mom and dad, or we do not want to be like them at all. Somebody give me an amen. We emulate what we see, or we don't like what we saw, so we're going to try to do something else. So if our homes, whether it's you're a senior citizen and you have grandkids coming up, or maybe you're 30 years old or 24 years old and you're now starting a brand new family, it is now is when we have to put into practice the formula for a proper home. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't. I tell you, we talk to a lot of couples that are struggling because they don't know. Mom didn't tell them. Dad didn't tell them. Their marriages were chaotic. Mom got a divorce and dad's gone off. And they're just struggling. And now they have kids and they really don't know what to do. It's because we have to take what the Bible says and we have to formulate some truth. So how do I make your home a trauma center? And it's very important that we do. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to make sure the doors are always open. The doors are always open. If we do not have open doors, then what we have is we have hours, moments that a kid may try to talk to us. So let me give you a few things. The first one is, do I have a motivated staff? Do I have a motiva motivated staff? Moms and dads, single parents, you are the chief physician. You are the one that may not be able to give them medication physically, but the words, the influence, and the care that you give to them is better than any medication that a doctor could ever give to them. Jesus was also called the great physician. In Mark chapter 2, verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, These who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Even Jesus said in his philosophy is, I'm here to help those that are hurting, to help those that are struggling. And parents, when we look at our kids, they may put the facade of everything is wonderful and great, but our teens... Our kids are struggling. They're struggling. And we are the physician. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 6, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. In other words, pick up their load. Let them know that you're there. My dad has passed for about 10 years ago. And... Uh, uh, Many of us have lost our parents, and um, uh, it's tough sometimes. It's th every Sunday, about 5 or 6 o'clock at night, I'd pick up the phone, and I'd call my dad and call my mom. And uh, I would talk to dad, talk to mom, um, just hearing their voice. And my dad was one of those old schools. I mean, if you did something wrong, he, he would tell you about it. If you sinned, he'd let you know about it. He didn't comfort me because I did something wrong. He would call me out. And you know what? I think that's what parents should do. I think a parent should be very comforting 
but also very confrontational. If something is wrong, my dad is the physician, and my dad would have corrected me in what I did. He was motivated. In Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6, it says this, God is God, marriage is marriage, and kids are kids. If kids become the priority over the marriage, the marriage fails. So goes the marriage, so goes the family, and so goes the family, so goes the nation. Sometimes we as adults need to check into a hospital to learn how to deal with stuff. Kids' words, our words to our kids are like medication to them. They, they need that affirmation. You, you see a kid, a student that is hurting, struggling. And you're a busy man and a busy mom. And you say, what I have to do is not as important as what I have to do. And what I have to do is parent my child. Not just have a child. My job is to parent a child. See, when a physician is getting ready to go through surgery and they have to make a decision, open heart surgery say, they have to make a decision. They go in sometimes and they see the process. And many times they, they leave the surgery room and they have a consultation with family members. And sometimes in that consultation they may say, here are the options that we have. We could do a stent, or we could do triple bypass, or we may have to do this bypass. My recommendation is this, but it's your call. And then with that educated information, we sometimes have to make the call. In our homes as a physician, it would be like doing this. I don't want you to talk to the parents. Physician, I want you to talk to the kids. And sometimes the kids will make a decision that the parents should make because the parents are absent when the physician is in the room. And while we do, the kids would say, what's the easiest way? What's the quickest recovery? And so often in our homes, we put a band-aid on what is very important to have surgery with. And sometimes in order to be fixed in the home, in the trauma center, we have to go through major heartache, some major surgery that sometimes we would like to stick our head in the sand. Sometimes we'd like to think it didn't exist. But in order to be healthy long term, we have to go surgery short term. Sometimes we don't want to do that. But we have to be motivated. We have to understand what the consequences are. And then, do I have an educated approach as a parent? Do I have an educated approach? What does that mean? Well, there are so many books on parenting, on marriage, more books than we could ever look at. But just looking at what we have, we have YouTube, right now media, sermons, seminars, books, blogs, information all over the place. That if you were wanting to purchase something, you would do some investigation. You would want to see what the best product is. You'd want to find out the information that you have. And sometimes we do not use our educated minds to be a trauma center because it takes work. You can't say this anymore, I don't know. There's too many resources. There's too many parent books. There's too many friends. There's too many things going on. Wise parents need to know the difference between drama and trauma. You've, you've seen them. You've talked to your kids. You've seen your kids fight. You've seen you guys fight. And sometimes our kids have drama because you have drama. The kids are just watching mom and dad. And if the kids are watching mom and dad have drama and not have a fixed trauma, then the kids are going to emulate what mom and dad do. All feelings should be validated. You know, it's not a sin to get mad. It's not. Sometimes it's even justifiable to get mad. And sometimes we look at the kids and we get mad at the kids because they got mad and we're yelling at them and they're 
not near as bad as what we were yelling at them for getting mad. And it's got chaos. So how do we stand a trauma center with an educated approach? Is we have to realize that everything that child does is validated. It's questioned. Why? Why do you feel that way? Because we see what's on the outside, but the students have something deep inside them that they're struggling with. So where can we do this? The Bible calls it wherever you go. At bedtime, in drive time, at meal time, and even play time. Our kids have to know that we want to be with them. We need to sacrifice for them. Are we motivated? And then, do I have a dedicated plan? Do I have a dedicated plan? We trust the doctors to prescribe the medicine, and that doctor, we have trust in that doctor. But in order for us to be dedicated to a doctor, that doctor has to have trust. And for our students to have trust in us, we have to be trustworthy to them. And I understand that most decisions that we make for our kids, we're, we're, we're smarter than them uh, until they turn about seven and then it probably <laughs> changes a little bit. But we should always think on what's best for them. But here's what most parents do. You ready? What's best for me? And when we get the idea that it's best for me instead of best for them, what happens is they start resenting us. So what we must do is we must look at them and validate them and understand what they're going through. And we have to look at their needs and their desires and their problems. And as a trauma center, the doctor doesn't come into the doctor's office and say, you know what, I think it's going to be best for me if you do this. The doctor will always say, what's best for you? And what I look at my students or my kids or my spouse or my husband is I have to say, I will sacrifice to do what's best for you. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That, that's the training aspect. And then in Genesis chapter 2, 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, that these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep all of his statutes and his commandments which I command to you, and your sons and your grandsons, and the day of your life, that your days shall be prolonged. I'm going to make a statement, and I want you to remember this one statement, if anything else. Spouses, stay. Kids, leave. What does that mean? That means God gave you a spouse and that you are supposed to love that spouse till death do us part. Amen. You have kids. And those kids are going to grow up and leave. Amen. And if we lose our spouse because our kids, we've lost God's plan. We have to have a dedication, a mindset that I am one for life. And that spouse is mine. My kids, I'm going to train them up. And when they're 18, 19, 35, whenever they leave the house, <laughs> they're gone. But my spouse stays. And if we lose that mindset that I will throw my spouse out because my kids are causing drama... Instead of fixing it in the trauma center, our kids, the shareholders, win and the president and the CEO fail. Family is not a democracy. Family is a theocracy. It is God-led. And if we want a Christian trauma center, it is God first, period, then marriage, then kids. Well, you're saying... What about the kids? The kids are important. Every decision that we make has to be about our kids. Every decision we make should be about them. But it should go first through God, spouse, kids. We do this at weddings all the time. Put your hands like this right here. God is at the top. 
Your spouse to the left and you're to the right. The closer you get to God, what happens to each other? You get closer together. But when you do not put God where he needs to be, the chaos and the drama of your life can go absolutely crazy. And you should have a drug problem. I should have a drug problem. My parents drug me to church. <laughs> and you need to drag your kids to church. Because there's two institutions that's going to change your family. Number one, your family, your home, and the church. The school system will educate them, but they will not give them morals and ethics. Your home and your church should do that. So, the last one. Do I let the saturated system lead my family? I want my kids, I want our church to be saturated with God's word, God's love, and God's protection. If we do not allow God's will to be done in our homes, God's blessing, his presence will be out. We sometimes allow the sin of the parents to be winked at, and God says, I need you to be confronted on because the sin of the parents will fall down and the kids will emulate what mom and dad does and they will only be who you are. But when the parents understand I was wrong, I apologize, I'm going to turn from where I am. Do you know what your kids are seeing? They're seeing a man and a woman of God doing what God has asked them to do, humble themselves, admit I am wrong, turn from my wicked way. God says he will heal us and our land. How do we do that? Through prayer, through devotions, through church, through communication, through intimacy, through honesty, through truthfulness. We can gain a saturated life of God's will within my life, within my kids, and with my surroundings when I allow God to take over my life. I can't ask God to take care of my kids if I can't even ask God to take care of me. If I won't allow God to break my heart, how can I have the right to break their hearts? What I must do is I must stand before God with an open contrite heart and say this, I'm going to guard my heart. And I want you to take care of my life. And I can turn the drama in my life. And I could give that to a trauma center in my home. And I can teach my kids through obedience of myself to say, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. There's many times that I should have apologized to my kids. But now they're old and gone, so I don't have to. But there are many times that I was wrong. I got mad, I said something I shouldn't have done, or whatever the case is. But because I was dad, you do what I tell you to do. Anybody ever do that? Instead of saying, guys, I was wrong, I apologize about that. And I guarantee you, to earn their trust, they would trust me and love me even more if they see the honesty within my heart and within my life. But men, we didn't see dad do that, did we? And because daddy didn't do it, I don't want to do it. You know, because it's very hard to humble ourselves. It's very hard to be honest with ourselves. But here's what the ultimate goal is. The ultimate goal is not to necessarily have everything that you want. The ultimate goal is this. Is one day, your kids may be 30, 40, 50 years of age, and they look at you, and they say, Mom, Dad, thank you. Thank you for showing me character. Thank you for showing me honesty. Thank you for showing me what real Christianity is all about. And when those kids 
raise up their kids. And they say, you know what? I did see dad communicate with God. I did see mom praying and reading the Bible. I did see them when they made mistakes apologize. I saw them in the kitchen playing with each other, patting each other on the booty and, and hugging each other and loving each other because parents need to let the kids know that you love them and the kids need to know that mom and dad, you love each other because they are going to do what they see at the end of their life and their kids are 30 to 50 years old the greatest thing that your kids will see is their kids saying the same thing your kids said. Thank you. It is a repetition. And it starts with a trauma center. Is your home a place where your kids and your spouse can get healthy? You may not know how to, but you can find out. You have to make sure those doors are unlocked. You have to look at their heart. You have to open up their key to their heart and talk to them. You have to love them. When they're hurting, allow them to cry. If they're mad, let them get mad. But confront them. Talk about it. Every emotion should be taken serious. Every emotion should be talked about. We can't allow the shareholders to run the corporation. God is the founder of the home. He has called the men to be the CEOs. But you know who does the work? It's not the CEO. And it's not the founder right now. It is the president. The president is the one that works. Makes the phone calls, does the job. The CEO gets the pat on the back, but the president gets the attaboys, and she does the work. And, and the shareholders, you know what they get? They get the dividends. But if the shareholders tell the president what to do and the president listens to the shareholders and tells the CEO what he has to do and the founder said, this is not what I had in mind. I have in mind a godly home. God first. Mom and dad, you're second. Kids are third. Because what spouses do what? What do the spouses do? They stay. What do the kids do? They leave. they leave. And they want to leave. And you want to make them want to leave. <laughs> Amen. When I was 17, I was ready to go. Until I was about 18 and a half, I was like, Man, maybe I should go back. But once I learned I didn't know everything, it changed everything, right? So let's be the parents and let's be the home that we need to be.